Hi there and welcome to uh, the Screencast of Lab 2. Uh, so we'll start with the donkeys. So I'm going to just start by um, changing the author there. Okay, so we're going to be looking at um, at the weight of donkeys uh, in Morocco. And um, so this was uh, collected in this paper here, the estimation of live weight and body condition, working donkeys in Morocco. And the idea basically is that uh, estimating the weight of a donkey is uh, is useful because weighing donkeys is generally difficult um, but of course measuring them is very easy you just need a tape measure weighing them you need a set of scales and coerce the donkey onto them which might be a bit trickier so the idea is that they, they went out and um, and did weigh a bunch of donkeys and also measure them in in order to try and develop a way to estimate the weight of the bonk donkey using um, the measurement variables so that future donkeys you can just measure in order to estimate um, their weight and they also looked at body condition. Okay so this first code block is reading in the data and taking a look at it so you can see that we have uh, seven uh, columns here we've got the sex of the um, donkey male and female we've got their age and years and we've got their body weight in kilograms uh, we've got the um, girth at the at the heart, so that's um, diameter if you like, um, so measured around with a, a, um, a tape measure at the heart, uh, also a girth at the umbilicus, and we've got the length and the height of the donkey as well. So perhaps one of the first things we, we want to do is um, produce a summary of this data to get kind of an idea as to what the average weight is, um, what the number of male and females there are, perhaps um, what, the, what the distribution of ages and girths and so on is. And we can do this with summary, but if um, you'll see that I've made an intentional mistake here in that I've deliberately typed donkey with a capital D in order to just show you what happens, because it's useful for you to know what happens. Of course, um, if you're anything like me, you'll be making lots of mistakes. Um, and so learning how to fix them is useful. So this is a very common error that comes up, object donkey not found. And it generally means that the thing you've used um, is not defined. And the reason usually for that is that you've made a typo. So you're using the name of an object um, that doesn't exist because you've made a, a typo. And um, one way to fix that is if you just put your cursor on the thing that you're typing and press the tab key, then it will give you options for things that start with the letters that you have there and one of them of course is lowercase donkey which is the thing that we want. Okay, So now when I run that code block it will now succeed. So I'll just add the original code back in as a comment. Um, using the tab key okay so we can see here that um, uh, the average body weight is about 122 kilos but there's quite a big spread isn't there from 52 kilos up to 222 um, and again, there's, there's reasonable spread with the, the various girths and lengths and heights and so on. So we're going to start by looking at the distribution of the body weight. So we're looking at this variable here. And we can get some idea of it from here. We, we know where the measure of centre is and we know a measure of spread. And we can perhaps get some indication as to centre, um, as to shape using the quartiles. But let's do a histogram instead with the code here. Um, this information message here is just telling you that it's using a default of 30 bins and that perhaps that might not be the best idea right so it gets sort of giving you the option to change it and we'll change that a little bit later but you can see here that this is slightly skewed to the right isn't it so it's not super symmetric um, you can see that the most donkeys sort of have a have a um, have a weight between 100 and 150 but some of them are very small and some of them are, are quite heavy so some of them are light and some of them are heavy. And it's skewed to the right a little bit in that the uh, tail to the right is a little bit bigger than the tail to the left. And um, we can change the number of bins. 
here just by adding this bins equals 15 argument and there we have uh, 15 bins and now of course we don't get that warning message that we had before because of course we've specified the number of bins now. So we could try this out maybe, I mean what happens if we use only 5 bins, then obviously we get a very coarse representation, uh, if we use lots of bins then we get a very noisy representation right where um, clearly this is um, super noisy, I mean we could go even further with say 100 bins and if we go far enough say 500 bins, uh, essentially at some point you're just sort of getting individual donkeys right in each spike and you get a, a lot of bins that have no donkeys in them at all. Um, because the data have been rounded we, we do get um, you know a certain number of donkeys with, with different uh, weights uh, because they're all rounded to the nearest to the nearest one. If they were unrounded I'd expect this to be essentially completely flat. Um, because you know you'd only have one donkey of any specific weight, um, but perhaps uh, you know around 15 is probably about right. And of course, changing the number of bins here doesn't actually affect the shape that we're getting very much because we've got actually quite a lot of data. There's 300 and uh, what did it say? 86 donkeys, something like that. 386 donkeys. Yeah. So we've got quite a lot of data. So changing the number of bins won't change things all that much. Uh, right. So how would we describe this distribution? Uh, so distribution of donkey weights is centered at about 100 and 120 kilos um, and ranges from uh, 50 kilos to 220 kilos. Right, so I've described center and I've described spread with the range. Right, so I might also um, describe shape. So um, the shape is slightly skewed to the right with um, a larger range of donkeys um, above the center than below the center. Right, so when I'm describing the shape here, I'm using a technical term, skew to the right, but I'm also using a non-technical term and just describing what I see. Right, essentially we've got a bigger range of donkeys um, past the measure of centre than we do have um, on the other side. And that just sort of covers me for in the situation where perhaps I might get the technical term wrong. So I know that some students get a little bit confused between skew to the left and skew to the right. Right? I'm not going to mark you wrong if you say skew to the left in this case, but you correctly describe something that is actually skew to the right. Because I'll just say, well actually you know what you're talking about, you just got the term wrong. Which is fine. I don't care about the term. I care about whether you understand what's going on. Okay. Obviously, if you get the term right, then that's a bonus. But um, you know, it's not, not such a big deal um, for me. So the next one, we're going to use a density plot instead. And you remember that a density plot is essentially just a smooth version of the of the histogram. So it just takes that same shape that we had before and just sort of smooths it out a bit. Okay. Um, and the advantage of a density is that um, you can quite easily put more than one on the same plot. So you could split this up um, by group and we can do that by using fill equals sex. Now there's two places that we can put the fill argument. Uh, we could put it um, inside, so it's something that we've got to put inside the density function obviously because we want to um, have densities for each sex. So we need it inside the density function but we could potentially put it here. All right whereby we get an error, object density not found, notice a similar error to what we had before when we tried donkeys with a capital D, but this time we've got the case right, it's just it doesn't know where to get the density variable from. Okay. The other place we could put it is inside the AES, All right. and in that case it w we actually, uh, oh sorry, fill equals density, what am I doing? Uh, we want to fill by sex, don't we? Of course it couldn't find density. Let's fill by sex. Okay, we get the same error, right? Object sex not found, right? Um, so uh, let me now put that into the AES and see what happens. And then of course we get uh, something correct. Okay, so essentially what you need to know is that whenever you put an argument, uh, whenever you're taking a feature of the plot, so in this case the fill color, from your data, it needs to be inside the AES. So the AES is what sets up the mapping from your 
data to features of the plot. So anything that comes from your data needs to be inside the AES argument. Okay. Um, notice we could have used color instead. Right, and that'll just change the color and won't fill it. And so here we can actually see we can actually compare the graphs quite well with color. When we use fill, of course, it colors them in, so it looks kind of cool, but it's harder to see the red one. Okay, so let's just add a quick note about this. Um, uh, we need to add the fill parameter to the AES. Generally, whenever we're taking a feature of the data, oh, so generally whenever we're mapping a feature of the data, or column I suppose, to a feature of the plot, e.g. color, fill, x, y, etc., um, we put it it in the AES. Okay. Now we could instead uh, we could um, add a little bit of transparency with the alpha as well. So we might also try adding some transparency here so that we can see through the blue density to the red one. Okay. And so we do this by setting the alpha. So this was the, the little the little hint here, alpha inside the geom density function to make them partially transparent. And again, there's two places we could put it. We could put it uh, here, right? So inside the density, but not inside the AES. And that's the correct place to put it because the 0.5 here is not coming from our data. It's just something that we're setting. We're defining it for all groups, right? So. Uh, we don't actually need that to be from our data and, and so it's not inside the mapping argument. I'll show you what happens if I do put it inside the mapping argument just uh, because it's something that's it's sort of a common uh, mistake to make. So if I do put it inside there what you'll see is that I get a, so it correctly changes the alpha, but what you see is I get a, an extra guide here that's telling me that when you see a see-throughness of amount this which is hard to tell because it's white, um, then it represents the 0.5 group. So essentially what we've done here is it's equivalent to adding a new column to our data called alpha and setting it to 0.5 for all observations. Right, and so, so therefore it's, it's kind of equivalent to plotting by group except we've only got one group. And so it's given us a guide and it's happened to have worked for the alpha, but the actual number here is meaningless. So if I change it down to 0.1, I'll get the same looking graph, right, as I did when I've got 0.9, right? So it's not actually responding to the number at all. All it's responding to is the fact that I've got some grouping. Whereas up here, whereas if I put it outside, then the number is useful. So if I put 0.9, then it's quite opaque. But if I put 0.1, then it's very transparent, right? So 0.5 might be a happy medium. Okay. Right. So the next plot uses a box plot instead. Okay. So we're using John box plot and we're automatically um, so we're mapping X to six and Y to the body weight. So there's the body weight and there's the sex. Um, and so this is another way to, to look at that same picture, right? It's essentially this picture, but we're using a different geometry. And so what we see here is, uh, so what you should be able to see is basically, um, there's not much difference between these two, right? And that the centers are in about the same location um, and the spreads are about the same and the shapes look to be about the same as well. So essentially these are basically the same distribution. So.
Okay, so notice that I'm being a little bit vague here, right? So I say there doesn't seem to be much of a difference. I'm not sort of, you know, saying there's definitely no difference, right? Um, the centers are about the same location. I'm not saying they're exactly the same. Um, I'm not saying that they're different. The spreads are about the same and the shapes are about the same, right? Generally, um, I, I'm intentionally vague with my language because we only have a sample here, right? So any differences that I see here um, could potentially just be to sample to sample variation. So when I see a difference, I'd want the difference to be quite large before I start saying something a little bit more positive. And we're using sort of harder language. Um, we, we get basically the same picture as we did here, right? Um, we can see a little bit more because you can see shape information. So in the males here, you can see that um, there's sort of more of them are spiked that are, are in this range here compared to the females. And there's kind of this little bump um, a little bit later on where, with a few more donkeys in the sort of 160 kilo mark. Whereas with the females, um, maybe the biggest bump is slightly to the left compared to the males. But then there's this other smaller bump at about 130. Right, so the distribute the, the actual shapes here are a little bit different, um, which is harder to see than which is easier to see in this picture than it is in this one because of course this one is summarized a lot more. Right, the box plot uh, reduces the amount of information displayed on the plot quite significantly. Uh, now, one thing that students always tend to to um, jump on top of is is these outliers. Um, generally, unless they're massively different, so there's a unless there's a huge gap between an outlier and sort of the the, the end of the, um, the bar here, um, don't worry about it. So if it's jumping out at you as saying this is clearly wrong, then maybe it's worth mentioning. Uh, if it's not, then it's not worth mentioning. Okay, so I wouldn't be mentioning any of this. Essentially, these are basically just completely arbitrary and it's up to the, it's essentially based on the, how, the, how the box plot function works. All right, so the box plot function, what it does is it takes the length of the box so that length there, it stretches it out a bit, which is somewhat arbitrary. It basically makes it 50% longer. And then it takes that length from the top of the box and from the bottom of the box. And any observations past those two limits, it then counts as being um, points that it should mark distinctly. Okay, so these points have been marked distinctly because they're one and a half times the interquartile range which is the difference between the two quartiles or the length of the box, one and a half times the interquartile range away from the edges of the box. So all, they, all it means is that these are your extreme observations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with that, uh, any of these observations. They might just be, you know, large or small animals, no big deal. Okay, so don't get overly uh, worried about outliers, particularly on box plots, because they're simply shown that way due to the algorithm that's used when drawing. Okay, so it's, it's basically completely arbitrary. Okay, so the outliers, so the, Okay, so the um, next thing we're going to look at is the relationship between body weight and other measures. So the first one here, uh, we have the relationship between uh, the body weight and height. So we have height along the x-axis and body weight on the y-axis. And we notice that we've got a massive outlier. Right, so here we have a supposed donkey that is way too tall compared to all the other donkeys. So this is an outlier that we should worry about. Um, similarly, we would have seen this if we'd done a box plot of the heights. I'm fairly sure we'll see it. Let's check. So if we do a box plot of the heights, so if we map x to height, don't need y, see that, then there. So this is one to worry about. These ones here we don't have to worry about, but this one is so, so wildly different than everything else that it's indicating that something's going on, right? 
So this is an example of an outlier to worry about. We'll see it. Okay, so um, we could try and find this one. So if this one has a large height, we could click in the da donkey data frame and uh, maybe sort by height. And there it is there. So there's the 179. The next biggest one, do next tallest donkey is 126. So this is a male donkey. Um, it's quite heavy. Uh, it's observation number 52 in the data set. Okay. That's how you can find it in the data set. Um, now we'd like to get rid of it in order to um, in order to redo this plot without that outlier being present, and so we can do that using the subset command, right? So this subset command uh, takes our donkey data set and gives us only donkeys with height less than 150. I got that 150 off that box plot or off that um, scatter plot there, right? So I could have used any any number between about 130 and 170, and it would have would have captured that, right? So when I run this command, um, what you'll see is that I get no output, and that's because, of course, this is an assignment. So I'm creating a new data set called Only Donkeys. And if you have a look at Only Donkeys, which has appeared up here, we'll see there's 385 observations of seven variables. And of, so, so, of course, we've removed one, haven't we? And if we click on that and order it by height, then we can see that the biggest is now 126. So we've got rid of that large one. Okay, so now um, we can redo this plot. So let's copy and paste the code from that plot. Okay, so there it is there, same one we had before. And now I'm just going to change the data set from donkey to only donkeys. And then I get the plot without that observation because of course only donkeys has all of the data except the one that was the outlier so when we do the plot we get all of the points except the one that was the outlier okay so that's the relationship between body weight and height um, we could do uh, the other ones as well so um, perhaps let's put them all in this block here we could look at the relationship between length and height or umbilical girth and height, or heart girth and height. All right, and if I run all of those, I'll get four plots. You can see that I can choose which one along here. So there's our height, there's our length, there's our umbilical girth, and there's our heart girth. Okay, and you can see that all of them show an increasing trend, don't they? So the relationship between body weight and each of the other variables is increasing or positive, it's going up, right, which makes perfect sense as the donkey gets bigger, longer, hot, taller, uh, bigger uh, circumference, or di uh, yes, circumference, then um, it weighs more, right, so this makes perfect sense, so let's um, add some notes about this, so all, um, so the relationship between body weight and each of the measurement variables is uh, increasing or positive and mostly a straight line trend seems to fit okay right so if you you imagine a straight line going up here it seems to go through most of the data reasonably well okay we'll see if this is correct uh, in a little bit um, so that's how you describe the relationship. Are they increasing or decreasing? Are they straight or curved? Which one would, has the strongest relationship? So the strength of the relationship is not talking about the slope or anything like that. Instead, it's just simply talking about how tightly clustered the observations are around the slope. Right. So a strong relationship should mean that there's little spread around the trend. So you can see that these ones here, height, length, and umbilical girth have quite a lot of spread around them, but heart girth is much more tightly clustered. So we'd say that that has the, the strongest relationship. So body weight versus heart girth uh, relationship is strongest as the points are most closely clustered.
around the trend line. And th this would hold even if the trend wasn't um, straight, right? So even if the trend was, you know, loopy or curvy in some way, then as long as the points are, are closely clustered around that trend, um, it would still be a strong relationship, right? So in other words, once you know the trend, you, you know a lot about the individuals. That's essentially what strength is meaning. Okay, so you might notice when you squinted a bit that there's a slight curve here between the heart girth and body weight. And we can see it a little bit better if we investigate it um, a little bit um, uh, more using perhaps a smoother. So let's go back and do that plot again. So I'm just going to copy the plot from up here. Right, so there's the point. So let's change it to a smooth instead. Right, so this is going to use a different geometry. And when we do that, we can see that that, that, that curve is, uh, so, so that um, smoother gives actually a curve. It doesn't give us a complete straight line. There's actually a curve there. Okay. Um, you don't have to worry about the method it's using or anything. It, essentially, all this is doing is sort of um, fitting a trend through each point and just allowing that trend to bend as you move through the data. If it wants to bend, right, it doesn't have to bend. It's just if it wants to bend, it will bend. So it's a good way of just detecting whether whether things are straight or not. And you can see that this is reasonably straight. It's only curved a little bit, right? So that would be my conclusion. So Okay. Um, so one thing we might want to do is see if we can force this to be a straight line. Okay, and so this is a common, a, a common thing that we end up doing because it turns out that in statistics, the only thing, the only type of model that is easy to fit, is a straight line relationship. Okay, a straight line model, um, and and so um, that doesn't actually restrict us very much because in many situations we can just bend the curve straight by doing a transformation. So we're just going to explore this a little bit. And one way to explore this is to take um, our plot that we did before with the point and just switch the scales to be log. So instead of plotting the, um, the heart girth, we could plot the log of heart girth. And instead of plotting the body weight, we could plot the log of body weight. OK, and you can see here that this is a much straighter relationship than this one up here, right? Um, now the disadvantage of doing so is of course now you're dealing with logs instead of the actual numbers. And so um, ggplot has a um, alternate uh, technique for doing this for you automatically, essentially just by changing the scale. So all we do is instead of having a linear scale here, we switch to a log scale, um, but leave the values themselves alone. And so that's what this next code block here is doing. So the first bit is just the piece we had before. And then we add on the scale x log 10 and scale y log 10. And I've given it the breaks just so that it, um, it gives those same uh, breaks that we had before on the axis. All right, 50, 100, 150, 200, and so on. And you can see that the breaks now are not constant. Okay, so this is a logarithmic scale. And hopefully most of you now are used to looking at logarithmic scales because you've probably seen them over and over and over uh, during COVID, right? Because COVID grows exponentially. And so it, um, in order to sort of adequately compare things, you need to be on a log scale. Okay, so just for interest, let's try a smoother to try and fit the average relationship. So let's do our smoother on this. So we'll just switch from geom point to geom smooth. So you can see here now that we've actually got something nice and straight. Okay. So back up here, it was a bit curved, and now it's nice and straight. Okay, and of course we could add both at once. So there's nothing restricting us to do uh, both at once. So what we could do is do, uh, we could put our points on. and then put our smoother on top. 
I'm going to do my points first, and then put the smoother on top. Oh, what have I done? Ah, points is not right, it's point. Okay, there we go there. So there's all the points um, put on, and there's the smoother going through it. So let's add a comment or two about our relationship. So relationship between uh, body weight and heart girth is nice and linear, i.e. a straight line. Uh, if we're on a logarithmic scale, log body weight. Okay. There we go. Uh, so now I'll hit the knit button in order to hopefully um, get all of that produced into a single document. Here's my notebook that I can then has all my um, all my code and all my writing in it, and that's what I will upload to stream.